Hi, everybody. Welcome to the LNG uh, 2022 um, report released by, organized by the IGU. Thanks, everyone, for coming here and joining us today at, uh, at the live session. My name is Tatiana Kandberg. I'm the director of uh, strategic comms and membership with the IGU. And uh, I'll just take you through quick administrative stuff before we uh, get moving. Uh, today, we're doing the presentation on the occasion of the LNG 2023 uh, International Conference in Vancouver uh, Industry Briefing, which, which will take place later today. And our di director of events, Rodney Cox, is here today to say a few words uh, a bit later. Uh, I'd like to start by introducing our wonderful panel today, who will take us through the report key findings. Uh, I'm very pleased to, to be joined by uh, John Frederick Mueller from uh, Reistad Energy, our knowledge partner on this uh, on this report. Uh, Vera Blay from uh, Global, uh, she's the Global Head of Established Benchmarks at uh, S&P Global Commodity Insights, and uh, Vera will take us through the pricing. Uh, we also have Carlos Guerrero with us from Bureau Veritas, uh, and he'll talk about shipping and, uh, and bunkering trends. Without further ado, let me introduce you to uh, our Secretary General, Milton Caitlin, who will say a few opening remarks. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to start by uh, thanking you for, for joining us here today for this release of the 13th edition of the annual World LNG Report. I, um, I'd especially like to recognise the hard work of the IGU LNG Committee and the report study group members as well as our colleagues from GII, GNL, and S&P Global Commodity Insights, and of course our knowledge partner on the report, Rystart Energy. And their efforts made the report possible in this extraordinary year. And this year's report has been keenly anticipated, perhaps more than others, because of the impact of events in Eastern Europe are having on the commodity and energy markets. It comes at a time when LNG is more vital than ever to the secure and reliable functioning of energy systems around the world. It's also a vital tool for controlling emissions, particularly as the crisis in energy supply is forcing even the most cli climate responsible economies to turn back to coal, wiping out emissions reductions we've achieved in recent years. The worst global energy crisis in memory is unfolding in the context of a fragile recovery from the global pandemic and compounding impacts of broader community, uh, of broader commodity inflation and food supply crises, all while the planet is warming and the need to reverse global emissions trends is urgent. This perfect storm of global scale challenges is making it increasingly difficult for the world to remain focused on the energy transition to avert dangerous climate change impacts. Despite the understandable need to deal with the calamity at hand, the world must stay the course of energy transition, and we believe that natural gas, together with a growing portfolio of decarbonised, low and zero carbon gases, will be key to making that possible. Gas is the fastest available, flexible, efficient and sustainable long-term vehicle to get the world back onto the energy transition path. And as you'll see in the report and here in today's presentation, the inherent flexibility of LNG uh, allows it to be delivered to almost anywhere in the world. As this report reminds us, LNG connects 40 importing and 19 exporting markets with global liquefaction capacity reaching another annual high in 2021. The repo report also shows the great potential for LNG in Africa and that, that continent's necessary economic development. Africa alone has over 120 million tonnes of proposed liquefaction, a quarter of last year's global capacity, waiting for final investment decision. If that capacity materialised, Africa and the people, and its people, could see great societal and economic benefits. The current energy crisis in the developed world, where the wealthy economies are worried about maintaining secure and reliable access to energy, to cook meals, and heat homes for their families is the only reality that millions of Africans have known to date. As the IEA noted in their recent Africa report, the entire continent, where 20% of the world's population lives, is responsible for just 3% of today's global energy emissions. Gas developments for domestic use and for export could bring the development benefits Africa needs. The presentation today 
will touch on the price trends. We're all too aware of the price rally that started after a rapid post-COVID uh, demand recovery and worsened as the Russia-Ukraine conflict added more stress to an already fully subscribed market. Addressing supply constraints is going to be critical to energy security and economic stability in the world. This is a great opportunity to reach complementary goals of enhancing global energy security by developing new sources and support development goals. But this requires long-term thinking and planning beyond the immediate issue. Energy security must remain a priority and it must be a key feature in the planning of the energy transition for the world to avoid future crises where it can. The global gas industry welcomes the opportunity to demonstrate how it can maximise benefits in sustainable, secure, affordable and reliable energy systems of the future. IGU stresses the long-term value of gas because LNG today and progressively decarbonised low-carbon gases will continue to deliver secure, reliable and safe energy to all corners of the world. LNG plays a critical role in ensuring the fundamentals of global energy security, economic stability and the energy transition, and this role has never been greater. As the world considers its options for navigating through these unprecedented times, policymakers should consider the options that are available and the time that is required to bring new supply online. And we sincerely hope that this report will contribute to their understanding of the opportunities inherent in LNG. Thanks again to all of you for joining us today, and I very much look forward to this presentation of the IGU 2022 World LNG Report. Thank you very much and uh, good morning. I'm delighted uh, to join today to talk about the price trends observed in 2021. My name is Vera Bly. I'm Global Head of Established Benchmarks at S&P Global Commodity Insights. There are three things that really stand out when we look at price trends um, over the last uh, a year or 18 months. And the first I would mention is sort of the dramatic reversal of price trends from 2019-2020 when supply outweighed demand destruction seen under COVID-19 lockdowns to recovery scenario in 2021 in which the rate of demand growth exceeds supply additions. As a result, spot energy prices surged to historic highs uh, and stayed well above the long-term contract formulas um, that are used either based on Brent or Henry Hub. Second, we've seen an increased um, level, significantly increased level, really, of, of volatility. Um, and uh, that's is something observed across many commodity markets, but I think particularly holds true uh, when you look at global LNG and European gas markets uh, year on year. And while volatility is typically a facilitator for trade, too much of it um, actually leads to the opposite. And so we've see, observed a reduction in the number of market participants in LNG trading and market activity has fallen back. And the third observation is that we've seen the dramatic shift towards Europe's newfound active role in the global energy market and the emergence of Asian demand elastic elasticity, particularly in China and India, uh, where we have seen a significant cut uh, in LNG imports year on year so far. We've seen dramatic price shifts in 2021 in, in Asia, um, as we've observed, um, you know, and you can see on this slide with the plus Japan Korea marker, the JKM benchmark reflecting cargoes delivered into Northeast Asia. And you know, what kept supplies tight throughout last year? Outages at many global liquefaction projects due to unplanned shutdowns at plants and extended maintenance periods due to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. On the demand side, there were also a range of factors. Uh, China's emissions, pollutions, reductions policies focused on coal to gas switching, um, a drought in Brazil depleted hydro reserves uh, leading to a switch to spot LNG. Uh, in fact, demand has gone up by almost 200%, and several other countries and regions uh, also significantly increased LNG imports in 2021. In Europe, we've seen, of course, the combination of well-publicized issues tightening 
LNG supplies and the reduction in Russian pipeline flows, meeting a strong recovery in downstream demand. And this led to a drawdown in storage stock um, a cushion, really, over the summer relative to the five-year average. So come winter 2021, Europe's role in the global gas markets had dramatically changed from that of a global gas balancer to actually having to compete actively uh, with Asia for flexible spot LNG cargoes. And this has led to the inversion between JKM prices and those on the European gas hub, you know, the TTF, um, meaning the JKM forward curve began to price below the TTF forward curve in mid-December 2021. And since the outbreak um, of the Russia-Ukraine conflict in late February, the JKM has been pricing at a sustained discount to the TTF, at times up to 30% below. And market expectations expressed in the forward curve uh, indicated that the JKM may price below the TTF uh, well into 2023. So the Atlantic Basin LNG market really grew in importance as the year progressed based on the factors that we've mentioned so far, depleted storage, reduced pipeline flows, competition for supplies from Brazil, and you know, imports into Brazil effectively tripled year on year um, and uh, for LNG in 2021. And during the third quarter, Brazil became the largest importer of US source LNG. Based on this competition, the Platz des Northwest Europe LNG price remained above the TTA for the majority of 2021. But in the fourth quarter, uh, we saw the, you know, again, quite dramatic change in the relative values and the Platz des Northwest Europe market began to price at a discount uh, to the TTF once more. And we see this continue into 2022. So the cost to regasify LNG into key European terminals has risen significantly, pressuring uh, the LNG import price. And then you contrast the story in Europe with the US, where US gas prices presented by Henry Hub front months uh, uh, traded in a relatively narrow range through 2021. The correlation between Henry Hub and international LNG prices therefore remained weak um, during 2021 and 2022. Uh, the Platz Gulf Coast marker, the GCM, which represents US LNG spot cargoes on a free on board US Gulf Coast basis, demonstrated the margins available to companies with offtake volumes from the US. And the average premium for FOB spot cargoes against Henry Hub linked term offtake volumes from US LNG producers was around $21 per MMBTU in winter 2021. So in summary, we're, when we're looking at LNG pricing trends, LNG prices are moving in a close band with each other when you look at the regional LNG markers. The LNG spot market broadly is trading between Henry Hub and TTF, but there are very wide differences between LNG prices and the major Atlantic gas hubs. Gas hubs within Europe are trading at record differentials to each other and particularly calling out really the differential between MBP um, and uh, TTF. Asian end users have benefited uh, from more competitive Brent linked prices in the last year or so, but with Brent you know, in the $100 and up to recently $120 uh, per, per barrel uh, range. Crude link prices are also at historically high levels. And it's worth remembering that um, for the two years preceding, so in 2019 and 2020, Asian end users importing of crude link prices were paying double what spot importers <coughs> were paying at the time. There has been an increase in Henry Hub linked term contract activity as the US has moved quickly uh, into taking advantage of the current market uh, situation by pushing ahead with new projects. So LNG pricing remains complex and interrelated between oil indexation and the Atlantic pipeline hubs, while LNG markers around the world function as critical benchmarks to guide trade flows uh, and trade economics and also investment, most notably uh, for the letter where we've just recently seen also the first major debt financing of a new LNG project using spot LNG market-based pricing for significant 
portion of the SBAs. So it's a complex world, uh, but one where we've seen, I think, some remarkable uh, price trends and looking forward to discussing this more in this forum as well. Thank you very much. Hello, uh, my name is John Frederick Muller. I'm a senior partner and head of consulting for Asia Pacific for energy consultancy Rise at Energy. Thank you all for coming out this morning. I uh, also want to give a thanks to uh, the International Gas Union for uh, trusting us with, uh, with this important and exciting project of writing this year's report. I also want to thank the study group members for valuable contributions throughout the work with the, with the report. So in this section, we're going to go to LNG trade, liquefaction plants, and regasification terminals. So starting off, so the global LNG trade grew by 4.5% uh, in 2021, uh, reaching an all-time high of 372 million tons. So this was basically driven by a quite strong economic recovery uh, post-pandemic, uh, also by a uh, quite severe uh, winter, in, uh, especially in Europe, and also a drought, a very severe drought in Brazil. And the growth was basically covered by increased exports from the United States, which increased their export by 50% in, uh, in 2021. And also Algeria and Egypt added quite significant volumes into the, into the trade. Uh, there were, however, some markets that delivered less volumes uh, as compared to the past. Uh, primarily driven by technical issues, uh, declining feed gas, and also uh, delayed uh, commercial development of different backfill projects. Uh, and the countries uh, that are on top of this list includes Nigeria, Trinidad and Tobago. You also have Norway there and also Peru. Uh, in terms of re-exported trade, uh, what we saw was that uh, re-exported trade grew quite significantly by 35%. We see a lot of the um, operators expanding their terminals with additional storage capacity, with additional uh, capabilities of uh, reloading cargos, etc., to take better advantage of uh, potential arbitrage and different opportunities in the market, which I think in general is positive for the market, becoming more a more liquid market. Um, Asia was the largest receiver of these volumes in 2021, and Europe was the region re-exporting the most. And interesting to see uh, both um, uh, Spain and France now on the top of the list of re-exporters, uh, pushing down Singapore, which have taken the lead for the last two years. And Singapore this year came in in fifth place. Also, if we look at the, at the graph here in terms of the top exporters, um, Australia retained its position as the, the leading exporter globally with uh, 78.5 uh, million tons, followed very closely by Qatar at 77 million tons. And the US came in uh, in third place uh, for 2021. Um, looking at uh, the importers, uh, the next slide here shows the, the delta in imports from 2020 to 2021. And we see a big change here in China. And China in 2021 uh, went past both Korea and Japan and was now the largest importer of LNG globally. Had a very strong growth in imports, growing 15% from 2020. Um, this was driven by, by uh, increased economic growth and also increased use of gas in the power sector. That's the two primary drivers of this. In terms of new markets coming in, uh, Croatia was the only new market in 2021. Uh, adding to the number of importers. So from 2021, we had 39 countries around the world importing LNG. So we're getting to a quite big uh, foundation of countries globally that are now set up to be able to receive cargos uh, all across the world. Uh, in terms of the largest importing regions, Asia Pacific was the largest importer region. Uh, they accounted for about 41% of the global imports. And when we talk about Asia Pacific uh, and Asia as regions in, in this report setting, Asia Pacific basically relates to Southeast Asia, Korea, Japan, and Australia and the Pacific. And when we talk about Asia, that relates primarily to the, um, the southern parts of Central Asia, India, China, and Mongolia. And the Asian market came in second place in terms of, in terms of size, making up 
about 31% uh, of imports. So if you look at Asia Pacific combined, uh, it's by far the largest des destination for LNG cargoes, uh, accounting for, for more than 73% of the global imports. So um, no doubt where the majority of the market is there. In terms of, um, in terms of LNG trade moving forward, we think it's going to be quite high on the spotlight in terms of what's happening globally, uh, especially now with the, with the Russia-Ukraine conflict. We're seeing uh, a lot of changes and constraints in the gas market, especially in Europe, uh, and also with the EU's uh, power, Repower Europe plan, uh, planning to cut two-thirds of, of Russian gas imports by the end of this year, and also limiting uh, to, to totally the imports of hydrocarbons by 2027, uh, it's quite clear that Europe needs to diversify <laughs> their import mix, and the most likely outcome of that is increased imports from Middle East, from North America, and also potentially from, uh, from Africa. In terms of liquefaction, uh, what we saw in 2021, we saw almost 7 million tons uh, per annum of capacity coming online. Um, that was driven by, by several projects. Petronas had their second FLNG unit installed in Malaysia. You had the Corpus Christi Train 3, and you also had the uh, Yamal LNG Train 4, which completes the full development of that project. Uh, however, over the first four months of this year, we've seen more than 12 uh, million tons per annum coming into the market, so more than the entirety of 2021 combined, driven by quite big projects in the US with Sabine Pass and also with the, with the 12 trains at the Kalkashu Pass coming into the mix. Uh, and with these projects coming online in the US now, we see US stepping up, becoming the second largest uh, potential exporter in terms of liquefaction capacity, uh, surpassing Qatar, but still uh, a little behind Australia. So it'll be very interesting to see when we get to this place next year in terms of how the ranking looks for the key, key exporters globally. In terms of volumes and uh, the sanctioning status of this, this is what we're looking at at the next slide. So the all red installed ones are the dark blue, the green ones are under construction, and the blue ones are the ones that are in pre-FID stage. So in 2021, uh, the volume of approved liquefaction capacity, so new approved projects, reached 50 uh, million tons per annum. So basically seven times the volumes installed in 2021 was approved for uh, further development, which is quite significant and among the highest numbers we've seen historically in this respect. Um, and currently there's more than a thousand uh, MTPA of pre-FID projects. So there's a big uh, project pipeline of projects to be developed over the next coming years. What we saw last year was that uh, 130 MTPA of new projects alone was resurfaced last year. A lot of this is driven also by the, by the constraints and the high prices we've been seeing in the market, uh, driven among other by, by Russia-Ukraine conflict. Uh, so it's very interesting to see how this develops moving forward. There is, however, uh, quite some projects in the pipeline that probably not materialize, but the good thing for the gas market is that there is quite, quite a lot of volume to develop moving forward to also continue uh, to feed, uh, feed the world with, uh, with liquefied natural gas. Um, in terms of floating developments, um, at the end of, uh, of April this year, we have four floating facilities uh, globally. Um, and what we've seen there is a trend of moving from more bespoke solutions to more standardized concepts. We see uh, smaller solutions, uh, standardized concepts, and a very hard focus on keeping costs down and keeping high efficiency. You can also draw a parallel to what we're seeing in the, in the onshore market in terms of onshore terminals there, where a lot of the developers are moving a little away from the really capital heavy, big scale projects and developing more small scale uh, developments where you have a more modularized approach and can develop more smaller trains and then build on capacity as that is needed. In terms of uh, utilization, uh, the utilization rate for the liquefaction uh, plants increased quite significantly last year and averaged 80.4% globally, 
which is up from 74.6% in 2020. Uh, and actually seven out of the exporting countries have a utilization above 90%, which is, uh, which is a quite, uh, quite good utilization and quite high utilization. And in terms of the increase in exports, it's, I would say, especially the US that have uh, taken advantage of this uh, with a very strong increase in utilization from 76% in 2020 to more than 100%, basically 103.4% in 2021. So the US was producing above nameplate capacity uh, for the year as a whole. And we see that also for some other countries. We see that for UAE and Qatar in the Middle East, which both are, uh, have been at the utilization rate of 107 and 103% respectively. So uh, a lot of these markets are producing and delivering LNG um, at maximum capacity, more or less, uh, at current. Uh, in terms of regasification terminals, uh, the next slide here shows projects that are existing to the far left, uh, projects that are currently under development in the middle, and projects that haven't yet had the final investment decision taken. And as you see, Asia and Asia Pacific is kind of dominating across all of these three categories. So about 54 MTPA of regasification capacity was, has been added since the beginning of 2021. Um, and the largest capacity addition was the Alsor import terminal in Kuwait at 11 million tons per annum. So the total global capacity now is slightly north of 900 million tons per annum, which is about twice uh, or around twice the size of the, the liquefaction capacity. Uh, five new import terminals uh, was developed uh, during 2021. Uh, five expansions of current plants were also brought online. Uh, quite a significant portion of these were planned to start up in 2020. But due to COVID, there's been quite some delays, and a lot of these projects was pushed into 2021. Uh, and also, already this year, three new terminals have started up uh, in China, Japan, and El Salvador. And El Salvador brings then the total tally of importing countries to 40. So that's continued to expanding. Uh, in terms of the utilization rates uh, across the regasification space, it's been quite similar uh, last year as we saw in 2020 at 43%. Uh, as you see from the chart here, Japan is the country with the highest regasification capacity, but China's regasification capacity has really increased over the last uh, couple of years. And they've more than doubled their capacity in the last five years and really kind of increased their uh, capability of, of taking increased cargos in this space. Um, in terms of the terminals in Europe, uh, utilization there were around 45%, uh, slightly different from the northern parts of Europe and the southern parts. Uh, with the, the Ukrainian conflict, uh, lower production domestically in many of the countries and also reduced uh, imports from Russia. We've, uh, we've seen that uh, Poland uh, Belgium, Netherlands, among others, have had utilizations up in the, in the 70 to 80% range. And finally, in terms of new regasification terminals, um, as of April this year, uh, 164 MTPA of new regasification terminals are under construction. Uh, this includes 19 onshore terminals, uh, four, no, sorry, 12 floating units, and also 13 expansion projects. Um, and what we're seeing is that most of the capacity is, that's under development is coming in Asia or Asia Pacific, and it's China and India that's taking the lead. Um, and six new markets are sailing up as new potential import markets over the next three years. And that's basically Finland, Ghana, uh, Nicaragua, Senegal, Vietnam, and the Philippines. So we're continuing to expanding the base of importing countries. Um, so uh, the market is becoming more and more uh, liquid in terms of potential offtake for, for these uh, cargos, and there's quite a good pipeline of potential both regasification terminals but also liquefaction plants uh, to be developed moving forward. So, well, good morning, everyone. My name is Carlos Guerrero. I am very pleased to be here with you today to introduce uh, the uh, shipping part of the report and the LNG bunkering as well. So, first of all, to start with a global view uh, of the shipping uh, section, LNG carrying section, uh, with the increase of uh, uh, trade uh, voyages uh, in the last uh, year, 
12% increase with regards to 2020, and also uh, an increase in the LNG carriers segment, LNG carriers available in the market uh, have grown to 641 vessels with 64 uh, delivered in the, in the last year. Uh, we have to say that in the report, we are in, specifically in the LNG shipment report, we are uh, addressing vessels that are above 30,000 cubic meters. A small scale is not specifically addressed, only in the LNG bunkering section for the vessels that are actually involved in, in bunkering. We also have included in the list uh, the uh, existing FSRUs and FSUs, uh, 50 in total. Uh, five of these vessels are uh, in the last year uh, laid up. And uh, we include also a list uh, uh, of the vessels that are on order that uh, you can see here that this is a significant number that is uh, approximately one third of the total uh, fleet. So in terms of uh, trends, uh, we address, uh, first of all, the ship's uh, capacity, uh, because of course uh, we have seen the most standard uh, LNG carriers uh, under construction and recently delivered are in the range of 170 to 180. Standard sizes, most of them are 174,000 cubic meters. And this is what you can see here in the chart uh, in the left-hand side with the vessels that are less than 10 years old. Of course, there are existing vessels uh, trading uh, with the small sizes that were delivered before. And a significant portion of the ones that are in between 10 and 19 years old are the Qatar fleet, uh, Qatar gas fleet, uh, Qmax and Qflex, that are actually bigger than the standard sizes with 216 and 266,000 cubic meters. Continuing with the trends in the LNG carrier segment, we can say that, of course, all the uh, cargo containment systems, the type of tanks, the propulsion systems, and other technologies that are installed on the LNG carriers these days are basically proposed in order to reduce the uh, uh, unitary freight cost or the transportation cost to make the vessels more flexible, to be, uh, to be more efficient with the reduced uh, fuel consumption, for instance, with a, a lower boil of rate, meaning that the, the uh, containment system for the LNG are more efficient in terms of insulation and uh, also the relicofaction and subcooling system that are installed on, on board of the ships, that uh, meaning the, the, the flexibility for the charters and owners to use uh, LNG as fuel or eventually other type of fuels on board like uh, fuel oil. So we uh, have included a lot of information regarding the technologies in the, in the report. Uh, the latest technologies regarding propulsion, of course, is the two-stroke engines, but uh, new technologies have been developed very recently by two main manufacturers, WinGD and, uh, and, uh, Men, and MAN in, uh, in Denmark. When we are addressing the uh, cost of transportation and the vessel's cost, uh, we have included also very uh, exhaustive information regarding the uh, cost of LNG carriers. Uh, in this chart that you can see on the left-hand side, actually, we got the information from uh, shipping brokers specialized in LNG carriers. Uh, they have uh, very nice information regarding the cost of construction of LNG carriers uh, in the last years. Uh, with the date of delivery and the duration of the, of the contract, of the construction period. And uh, nowadays we can see that uh, the LNG carrier prices are increasing because of different reasons, of course, inflation, the uh, raw materials and equipments are becoming very expensive compared to prices uh, in the middle of 2021. We also include, uh, of course, uh, some figures regarding the charter rates of these uh, vessels for the uh, West, uh, for the Pacific uh, trade, for the Atlantic trade. Uh, of course, this is uh, cyclical, cyclical. We always say that in the winter time, we have uh, significant peaks in the charter rates of the LNG carriers that you can see here in the previous years. Uh, in some uh, cases, up to 200,000 uh, uh, dollars uh, uh, or uh, even 300,000 dollars uh, per day uh, of a charter rate. And uh, nowadays, we can say that there are three tiers of uh, charter rates, uh, depending on the technology as well. Uh, depending on the propulsion system for these ships, all ships equipped with steam turbines are less paid than the modern ships with uh, two-stroke uh, dual fuel engines. And just to finalize, there is a specific section in the report that is very focused on LNG bunkering and in particular on ship-to-ship uh, -ship LNG bunkering with uh, tables including the uh, vessels uh, that are existing in the market uh, to deliver LNG as a bunker fuel 
and also including the vessels that are under construction, uh, with a significant trend, of course, these days, that is the volume, the average volume of these uh, small-scale LNG uh, carriers dedicated for, for bunkering, because, of course, the LNG fuel industry is evolving and uh, new projects are becoming uh, also big in terms of uh, bunkering capacity. So these days there are vessels uh, up to 20,000 cubic meters uh, actually available for bunkering in places like Europe or the uh, Far East. Uh, the leaders in the market have been, of course, Europe, uh, the Far East, and, and these days, of course, uh, as well, US. Middle East is uh, running a little bit behind, but they will develop also bunkering infrastructure in the coming future. And I think that's all I have for the shipping session. Of course, you have all the details in the report. Thank you very much.